on. Hello, welcome. I am Bob Plankers. I am a technical marketing architect in the Cloud Platform Business Unit of VMware. We are responsible for vSphere. We are responsible for things like VMware Cloud on AWS, on Azure. We make a great foundation for the Software Defined Data Center. I'd like to speak now about operational thoughts when it comes to vSphere. You know, the, we've talked about theory, we've talked about compliance, you know, let's get into some of the details around what we can do to secure our environments, you know, make them compliant, make them secure, that sort of thing. I want to start out by saying that there are a ton of different ways to interact with vSphere, you know, probably more than there ought, ought to be sometimes, you know, but the uh, uh, code.vmware.com, this is my shameless plug, code.vmware.com, has got APIs, it's got uh, code samples, it's got forums. If you want to program, PowerCLI is a particularly accessible route to uh, do some automation and things like that. And we had mentioned that the security hardening guides, the security configuration guides, have got PowerCLI commands. All of the PowerCLI commands you need in there, all of the rest of them documented here. You can download it, instructions on how to install it. We've got 277 different GitHub repositories as well. I mean, our font, Metropolis, is actually an open source, uh, open source project. It's out in GitHub as well. So visit that. Another thing that I always like to mention, uh, my colleague William Lamb has got a nice uh, web page on his site around virtualization and nested virtualization. And that is a great way to test things, a great way to try stuff out. You know, in a low pressure environment, you're not, you know, I don't know about you all, but I always test it in production. <laughs> but the, uh, and that's, you know, that's also a joke, you know, everyone's got a test environment. Some people are lucky enough to have a separate production environment too. Um, the, uh, um, this is a great way to have a separate test environment. And you can snapshot it, do things like that. Operationally, I want to start out with one of my favorite jokes, you know, the idea that the problem's always DNS. Well, that was great until we got all this crypto going on, you know, and now NTP as well. While you're patching, while you're moving through your environments to patch, please patch and change your passwords. The, uh, uh, you know, check your NTP settings. It was really surprising to me how many little problems, how many little slownesses, all that sort of stuff went away when I made sure everything had the correct NTP settings. Everything was doing that. I also got pushback from time to time from security personnel saying, we don't want to open firewalls to NTP sources and things. I said, well, then you can ha not have crypto. And uh, uh, well, that got their attention. I throw it out there as a thought. My other soapbox, if you can imagine me standing in a soapbox, it'd have to be a sturdy soapbox, I'm a big guy, The uh, uh, is SSH on ESXi. SSH. Uh, ESXi is an appliance. It is, we don't like to think of it as one, but it's a toaster. This is my toaster at home. I got it for 50 cents. Actually, my, hey, my dad, I can mention my dad. My dad got me this toaster when I was in college. And it has a maintenance hatch on the bottom. And it looks like it needs to be cleaned too. The, uh, um, this maintenance hatch, is it a good idea to leave the maintenance hatch open? Nope. Well, maybe, maybe not. Is it a good idea to stick stuff in from this direction? Well, there's some bars there. Might be hard, but you know, you can probably get it done. The English muffins I toast would probably fit just fine. And you know, is it a good idea to fire it up while the maintenance hatch is open and it's in this configuration? Depends on your goals in life. Do you like the fire department? The fire department in my little village, they're great, they're volunteer. I know half of them, wonderful. One of them, former coworker. And uh, um, you know, if I'd like to see them, maybe, but probably not a good idea. It's the same for SSH. SSH on ESXi is a maintenance hatch. It is there for support. All of the rest of everything should be done through the role-based access control models through vSphere. All of the rest, it, you know, there are warnings when you turn on SSH. You know, little little things. SSH for the host has been enabled. You know, that's a big warning. I think one of the worst things that we can do operationally is actually uh, what I didn't include here is the button to suppress that warning. You know, it's there for a reason because it's not supposed to be on. Shut it off. 
what's the biggest, oops, the biggest problem, there's usually a slide there, the, uh, uh, the biggest problem with SSH is that it looks like Linux. ESXi is not Linux. It really isn't. Maybe it, maybe it was early on in that, you know, we use Linux, as, uh, Linux in some of our appliances and things like that. ESXi is not Linux. A compliance scanner, compliance scanners are the worst. Okay, and I don't, you know, Zoe's smiling over there. The, uh, <laughs> she's clearly had a run-in with, with uh, these things from time to time. Uh, they think these things are Linux, and they look at things in there and they go, oh, the permissions on Etsy password are not right. Well, it's not Linux. It's only there because of something else that we're probably trying to get rid of, you know? And just because it's SSH doesn't make it Linux. Shut it off, keep, you know, there's nothing in there that you can do from a software patching perspective shut it off and sell it as it, it's a black box it's an appliance patch it look at the patch versions look at the build versions that's the compliance interface there you know i will get off my soapbox thank you for listening the uh, um but this is this is a conversation i have repeatedly twice already this week you know uh last week i i stopped counting the uh, um I want to talk about some features. In particular, I want to talk a little bit about EVC. I want to talk about the VMCA, the VMware Certificate Authority. Uh, and the highlights don't really show up very well here. Sorry about that. Uh, TPM 2.0, host attestation, VBS, secure boot. I'm going to fly through these things a little bit. They're all stuff you can look up. Uh, I also been prompted to mention that I do a bunch of blogging on the vSphere blog, the blogs at vmr.com slash vSphere. There's a particularly lengthy one on CPU schedulers that, uh, um, that I wrote a, f a few weeks back. There's also one from two weeks back about SSL certificate management and things like that. I'm trying to do more of that sort of stuff. So if you've got any ideas, I accept feedback, Twitter, email, rplankers at vmr.com, that sort of thing. Let's get into it. I've mentioned EVC a few times. Enhanced vMotion compatibility. After 18 months, you can't buy the same CPUs in a server. So you, you buy a cluster, you buy some hardware, and say you've got eight machines or 16 machines or whatever, and L1TF, MDS comes along and wants 30%. You're running that thing at 80% capacity, all great. MDS comes along and you know, th three years into that cluster's lifespan, maybe a lifespan, warranties are generally five years long, that sort of thing, and uh, um, you need to add capacity. But you don't have like CPUs, and so that really messes with vMotion, that sort of thing. Now, you, do you build a whole new cluster and manage it that way? Well, if you've got EVC on, EVC masks the differences between the CPUs, so that at an instruction level, so that uh, something that started out on one side can migrate seamlessly to the other side. And right now it's, it's harder to turn on later in life, the later in the life of a cluster. There's uh, work being done on that front, but the, uh, it's harder to turn it on. So remembering to turn it on when you first build a cluster is really important. If, you know, there's also some misconceptions around it, you know, oh, there's, there's a performance hit. There really isn't, you know, like the performance hit comes if, if an application needs a CPU instruction that is being masked out, you know. Most enterprise apps, 99% of all of our customers don't care, you know. Their enterprise app, their web logic server or whatever isn't going to use the latest, you know, whatever. And uh, so the operational gains really off offset any sort of performance detriment there might be, that sort of thing. The performance, again, the performance is, uh, there's not really a performance hit unless you need that. And there's also such a thing as per VM EVC as well. So if you've got a VM, my lab environment has got two Haswell, two boxes with Haswell CPUs, two boxes with Broadwell. And they made, uh, Broadwell's added some of the RD RAND, RD Seed instructions there, which are really interesting for randomness and stuff, entropy. When I want to play with that, I can set the per VM EVC mode on a VM that I want to mess with that on to be Broadwell. And then it'll stay in my two Broadwell hosts as well. So that's, you know, something to mitigate that. Again, and getting back to the idea that we try to make things easy to use, easy, easy to do, it's easy to do the right thing, that sort of thing. At a cluster mode, you can just pick, do you have Intel, do you have AMD? EVC does not help you move between CPU manufacturers. You know, if you've got AMD, you should stay in AMD. If you've got Intel, you should stay in Intel. 
Uh, you know, otherwise, you know, can you mix them in a cluster? Yeah, is it a good idea? Probably not, just because you can doesn't mean you should, you know, the, uh, uh, that sort of thing. But just, yeah, pick the, pick the EVC mode and it'll tell you right at the bottom. These are all HTML5 screenshots, by the way. That's a great selling point for 6.7, HTML5 client. Everyone loves to hate it <laughs> right away because everything moved. But then you think about an actual UX designer thought about where the stuff ne needed to go. Holy crap, it wasn't just engineers pasting stuff in on the, all the side or whatever. And everyone ends up loving it, but then they won't admit it because, yeah, you know, we all love to complain. Anyhow, That's true. VMware Certificate Authority. On the trying to make it easy to do the right thing front. We use SSL, we use TL, we don't use SSL, we actually use TLS, thank you. The, uh, uh, I'm gonna use them interchangeably because I've been around for a while. But the, uh, uh, the VMCA, managing all those certificates, is a pain in the duff. And so we invented basically what, what I call just enough CA. And we can, we can discuss, perhaps over a beer, whether it's enough CA or not enough CA. Edward and I were talking about it earlier. The, uh, uh, you know, but the idea is that inside of the cluster, the certificates, when, uh, when something joins a cluster, whether it's a solution like vReal as operations manager or an ESXi host or whatever, that it's rekeyed against the certificate authority that's part of vCenter. And so you can establish trust by importing the vCenter root CA certificates, which are just on the main page. You can import those into the, the infrastructure admin team. You know, the people that are dealing with ESXi at that level, there's usually just a handful of people in an organization. And the, uh, uh, you know, those people can import that. The checkboxes turn green, everybody is happy. And more importantly, if there's a problem, you can see that, you know, like if, if something else is keyed differently or whatever, the, you know, the thing will be red. Hey, you know, Chrome will give you the, you know, advanced thing and all that stuff, the warnings, that sort of thing. There's, uh, um, this is my little shout out to uh, uh, the Fiber Channel over Token Ring Alliance, Stephen. And uh, uh, yes, uh, my lab is all uh, in the FCOTR domain, but the, that was Tech Field Day 3, by the way. The, uh, um, yeah, things, wow. Anyhow, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's also the tech field day where I learned what Sambuca is. Thank you, John Obeto. But, <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah, Curtis. But uh, anyhow, uh, right now, best way to do this, uh, if you want to mess with the VMCA, is there's a command line utility that can do it. And you've got a couple of different options. There's a default where it's doing its own self-signed CA root. Uh, you can make it a subordinate CA, subordinate to an enterprise uh, CA or whatever. Edward's correctly shaking his head no. Uh, that means that that key material that's issued as a subordinate CA, anybody who's got access to that, which is anybody who's got access to vCenter, you know, which is a problem, you know, for some organizations, the, uh, uh, can uh, sign things as the organization. And that usually gives the PKI folks in an organization the, the heebie-jeebies. And so we really don't recommend that anymore. The, uh, um, the other thing, we do recommend hybrid mode, which is using the root CA that's built into vCenter for most of the internal cluster operations. And then replacing what we call the machine SSL certificates, which probably not the greatest name because they're actually the human facing ones, with custom signed, third party signed ones. So anybody going at uh, vCenter or the PSCs, the SSO op options, uh, gets a, a real thing and you don't have to install certificates and stuff like that in there. That's uh, usually talking to folks, that's what most people pick. So, mo and it's mostly because a cluster has got, a, f uh, a fully built out cluster has got hundreds, something like 300 different certificates in it. And this automation tool handles all of that stuff. You know, if you want to do custom third-party signed certificates, doing 300 of them is expensive from just a staff time perspective, and it's error prone. You know, you get something wrong in there or expirations or whatever, it's just, it's hard, so. Unfortunately, have you, for the hybrid CAs, have you fixed the VMRC problems? The VMRC problem. Remote console. Remote console. Require the cert of the hypervisor. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, I can look at that. Because it causes all sorts of problems because they're expecting to use the root certs mm -hmm. and they're not there. Mm. Okay. So you have to accept the cert, which is what people This is the first time I've heard of this, you know, so. Clearly our labs do not replicate 
everything all the time. VMware is full of lots of moving parts. So can you email that to me or tweet it at me or something? Will do. Okay, thanks, man. Mike, I, let's, can, I want to ask a few more questions about the cert authority. Sure. Are you planning on moving it from a hybrid cert so it's all self-signed to something that is actually not a subordinate, but a prop, something that actually has a proper root cert for everything? Um, I don't know our roadmap plans on that. So, and I probably don't want to go on record uh, <laughs> saying that because, you know, the knives and pitchforks and torches are being lit and sharpened. Yeah, Tom, Tom's not even the right guy to stab me either. So the, uh, uh, but, uh, um, it's a real problem there's, in a there's large work in this area. You know, there's plenty of work to be done here, and especially as it gets a lot more attention moving forward, we're discovering things that uh, um, it's generally true in software companies that the people that code the stuff up aren't the end users of it, and I say that that's you know that's just a generalization about software companies. The uh, and so f hearing feedback from the people that are trying to use it. That's one of my big jobs too, but I'm spread and I'm pulled in a lot of different ways here. You know, From people that actually have pain points around this, that actually have the label customer is incredibly powerful. And so when, when you've got feedback for that, you know, and this is, I know I'm you know, dead horses and everything here, I keep saying this, let me know, let me know. And because, uh, yeah, we can make sure that that uh, gets into the roadmap. VMware's got some new mechanisms for capturing these sorts of things. The idea of projects that aren't aren't little enough to be fixed on the spot, but aren't big enough to get a lot of attention, you know, that middle ground there, th this sort of stuff fits right in there, and so because just having 300 search to manage, even as even using the tooling is just plainly difficult every time because yeah, proper cert management means you actually switch out the root certs mm -hmm. every so often. Yep. Whatever that is to take by policy, yeah. and, that and that automation tool can help do that. But you know, the fact is, you have to continually use it. Correct. Yep. I'm going to move on. Sorry, I'm a little pressed for time at the moment. Secure Boot TPM. Order your hardware with TPMs. Trusted platform modules. I will probably say trusted plat TPM module at some point, like Mount Fujiyama hmm. or any of the other you know redundancies that are out there. The uh, uh, I beg your par your forgiveness on that. Uh, I tried to stay away from the on-premise. I try to stay on-premise uh, and not and uh, well being on premises. The things like that. Secure Boot is a cryptographic signing mechanism for the boot process. True for both VMs and for ESXi. ESXi uses it. Embeds when you install ESXi, it puts a key in the UEFI firmware. Uh, it's actually a Microsoft signing key because they apparently got to all the hardware manufacturers first, and so everyone, even Red Hat, uses that now. The uh, uh, which is just odd looking at it, but whatever, you know, uh, it works. And then that signs, you know, that can verify the bootloader. The bootloader verifies that, and then it just works up the stack. You know, the VM kernel verifies the VIB, uh, the VIB loader. VIBs are vSphere installable bundles. I did not know that until about three months ago. That's cool. The, uh, uh, I don't know how many times I've said VIB in the last 15 years. Uh, you know, and then it goes all the way up the stack. And a TPM, if you've got a TPM, a TPM can create an, uh, I think the wiki page calls it an almost unforgeable hash. So it makes me wonder a little bit about that. I'm going to need to do a little reading on that. But uh, a, a hash of all of that stuff, the metrics around that boot process, and stores it back in the TPM. A TPM it does a, a, a bunch of different things. The, uh, um, but in this case, it, ES, I'm sorry, ESX doesn't do it. vCenter will come along. vCenter server will come along and, the, uh, and read that out of the TPM and verify and recheck what it knows is running, and then it will do something called attestation, and a host will pass attestation. And it means that the cryptographically, everything that's running is something that was delivered from VMware, and it's in a state that we know and approve of. I mentioned this is also true for VMs. Again, checkbox, when you're building templates, when your clients and customers and friends and family are building che templates, check the box. I also always add a boot delay. I guess I didn't notice here. I always put a 10 second boot delay in there for console, let the console connect. Uh, there's a little bit of a network lag and it sucks to have to reboot it. This is a Dell TPM module. See, I did it there. Uh, this is a Dell TPM. If you've got servers that in the last couple of generations from Dell, HP, Lenovo, wherever, 
super micro. The, uh, you can add these after the fact. They're about $20. The uh, pricing may vary, I guess. Uh, don't buy them. They're cryptographically bound to the host that they're first installed in. So you can find them used on eBay, which is hilarious because you can't use them. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. nice. There's some guy in Florida selling just a ton of these things. And uh, I'm guessing that they pulled them out of a, a server. And uh, yeah. So uh, that one's actually for a 13G Dell. That, I think that one's mine, actually. So. Uh, and then attestation in the the uh, HTML5 client under monitor the monitor tab. There's a security tab, and it's got attestation uh, status in there. And actually, newer versions have got uh, status of T the TPM version, and it's got uh, TXT and some other information as well. This is an old screenshot. My apologies. Talk a little bit about virtualization-based security. We talked a little bit earlier about virtualization-based security. The idea that the VBS is a little bit of Hyper-V. This is actually a Microsoft concept. Uh, device guard, credential guard, they sometimes call it HVCI, hypervisor code integrity. Uh, it uses a little bit of Hyper-V. It's basically nested virtualization and for Hyper-V. And it enables a memory space that Windows uses to securely store credentials and things like that. And that really effectively ends a lot of the pass the hash attacks, a lot of credential attacks and things like that. Microsoft recommends that you turn it on early in your build process so that it makes sure that credentials get in there and that creden the credentials are being stored and the secrets and cryptographic material are, are stored in there. Uh, again, it's a checkbox. Checkbox, law of com uh, conservation of complexity. I forget, this is an Apple design fellow that uh, came up with that one. Can't think of his name right now, but the, uh, uh, you know, it's definitely got some stuff going on. IOMMU, hardware virtualization, EFI, secure boot. It'll turn all that stuff on if you're not using it already. So, and then in inside of the operating system, you just turn it on with group policy like you would do anywhere else. There's some documentation if you're going to look at this. Uh, the documentation has changed around this. There's some old documentation around enabling this that tells you to install Hyper-V proper and that. After Windows 10 1709 and all of Server 2016 and Server 2019, all you have to do is enable it in group policy. All of that stuff is being loaded and is present. All of what it needs to, to do is present already. You don't need the full Hyper-V. So that's a little less attack surface, a little less uh, junk to maintain there. You can enable it with UEFI lock or without UEFI lock. Uh, pros and cons, one of the big pros is with UEFI lock, it can't be disabled remotely. Uh, that's a con if you want to test it, but it's a pro if you don't want your adversaries to shut it off for you. So, <laughs> that sort of thing. Sorry, I'm flying here, but uh, I think you folks are getting the gist of, of this. And these are all, we've written a lot about these sorts of things, how to enable them, how to turn them on. You can test them in nested ESXN, ESXi and vSphere environments, that sort of thing. VM encryption. We really like VM encryption. A VM encryption is exactly what it sounds like. You know, it encrypts VMs. And it's granular. You can choose whether you want to turn on encryption for the VM itself, uh, just the VM files itself, the configurations and logs and NVRAM and things like that, or you can, and you can do the disk files as well. But we really like it because we think it's a lot easier to deal with this sort of operation at the infrastructure level rather than having to manage different OS versions and operating system types. You know, how do you teach op operations people how to do BitLocker on 2003? Oh, BitLocker's not involved, not on 2003, hmm, you know? Uh, 2008, 2012, 2016, 2019, Red Hat 4, Red Hat 5, Red Hat 6, Red Hat 7, Red Hat 8, Ubuntu, all this stuff. Or you can just do, you write one process, one way to do it. That's a heck of a lot easier. Mentioned that it, you can do the home files and the VMDKs. Uh, when you turn it on, it enables the virtual TPM functionality that we've got. We've got a virtual TPM if your guest OS needs that uh, the TPM functionality for something. The, uh, um, we can do that, but you need VM encryption. To turn on VM encryption, though, you need a KMS, a key management yeah. system, something that speaks to the KMIP protocol. And uh, you may have heard Edward and I talking about uh, hardware security modules and HSMs and things like that. Uh, m many of those speak KMIP. vCenter talks KMIP out to those sorts of things. Uh, they range in price. They range in complexity. 
If you're going to do this, though, you, it's got to be as reliable as DNS is for your infrastructure because you lose access to that key material. You cannot open that VM again. Sure, you can patch. Hey, you should patch. You should patch your HSMs as well. In fact, there's been new security advisories about uh, that H HSMs are a little insecure sometimes, and uh, uh, which is ironic. And uh, the uh, um, you know, a, t a cluster can tolerate that sort of thing if a, if a key manager is not available right away. The, uh, um, what happens when a, a VM is booted, the key, a secure VM, a VM encrypted VM is booted, the key is copied to all of the ESX hosts in that cluster. This is done for a HA reasons, the, the vSphere high availability feature. If it needs to restart that VM somewhere, it might, vCenter might be one of the VMs inside that cluster that needs to get restarted. And so it won't be able to get to that key material. And so that the, you know, chickens and eggs and, heart, and carts and horses and things, you know. So what it does is it copies that key out to all the hosts and it holds it in memory. And it's not stored anywhere. It's not stored on host TPMs. It's completely ephemeral there. So if the host is rebooted, it'll have to check all those keys back out again. But that's how HA works. That's how you know vSAN and things like that work as well. Mentioned that it's guest OS agnostic. You know, I alluded to this when I was uh, commenting on Windows Server 2003. What are the encryption options for you know your fire alarm controller that's still running on you know 2003 in your infrastructure and you can't? Yeah, it's just a mess. <laughs> Somebody comes along and says, "Hey, we need data at rest encryption for this." Yeah, no problem. You know, Windows Server 2003 doesn't even notice. You know. It, one of the gotchas here, it's got to be off. The VM's got to be off in order to encrypt the disks. Well, to turn it on, it's got to be off, but there's going to be a delay there while it encrypts the disks. But you can use the storage you've got. You don't need specialized storage. You don't need specialized disk arrays. You don't need SEDs, self-encrypting disks. SEDs seem neat, but they're four times the price of normal stuff. They lag behind in features. They lag behind in performance. Uh, you can't get an NVMe SED, for example. Uh, and uh, so if you want to use anything from, you know, last five years as far as storage, it's not going to be found in said form. So that's another great reason VM encryption is great. Okay, so uh, the yeah. VM boots up without you having to enter any kind of password, so it's just encrypted to the, to the cluster uh, key storage. Correct. Yep. Okay, so I can start it, stop it, whatever I want, but yep. I, it is within the cluster. So if I copy it out of the cluster, you copy it cannot it out. be started anymore. That's correct. That, so there's some backup implications there. Uh, most backup products work with VM encryption, but what it does is uh, backup products will usually ask it to be decrypted out and then the backup product will re-encrypt it. A lot of that is because of deduplication. I was going to mention vSAN deduplication works with, if you let vSAN do the encryption on disk, it can work with, it can do its own deduplication in that and still maintain on disk uh, data at rest encryption. Backup systems are like that as well. So, but it's another security boundary. It's another thing you got to worry about there. You know, what is my backup system doing with this? But yeah, if you copy it off, if you try to exfiltrate, hey, I want to take my Active Directory domain controller, or I want to take your Active Directory domain <laughs> controller that has all the keys to your kingdom, and I want to take that, and I'm going to take it home, put it in my lab, and sit and crack on it for a while. If it's encrypted, yeah, not that's not going to be possible. Also, when you turn this on, here, let's see where I'm at in my slides here. The, uh, um, when you turn this on, you also get additional permissions. I've got a slide coming out up here. Okay, the, uh, um, you've got some additional permissions that, uh, that come about around crypto cryptographic stuff. So here, you know, keeping, it, uh, keeping it easy to do the right thing, making it easy to do this, just flip the encryption policy. Uh, what I'm not showing is there's a slider up here that say that says you can you can choose what to do the policy you want to apply to these things separately. So if you don't want to do if you don't want to take a large outage to re-encrypt the disks, you don't have to. You know, just turn VM encryption on. Uh, we've got a lot of people that use databases, SQL Server, Oracle, that sort of thing. That what they'll do they don't want to sit and wait for the re-encryption of the whole thing. That would be a, a big outage for a monolithic database. So what they do is they just turn VM encryption on, and then they add additional disks that are encrypted, new, 
you know, you don't have to wait for those. Those can be hot added because, you know, you're not re-encrypting everything. And then inside the VM itself, inside the database software, they can just migrate and do their own, you know, databases have their own sort of data vMotion thing going on, you know, data management techniques. And so you can work around that in some ways, you know. So I just mentioned that as, you know, it seems like a gotcha. There are some ways around it. So there's some interesting connotations of doing VM encryption, either at vSYN encryption or VM encryption, that are hard to defend against in, actual, in actuality. A lot of the crypto people that I talk to want the application, from the application to the disk to be encrypted, for the disk to be encrypted. Mm -hmm. So that, and the problem with VM encryption and vSAN encryption is once you boot the VM, it's unencrypted in the operating system. Correct. Now I have to worry about the application to operating system encryption, which means now I have... Patching your, uh, patching your OS and your application is important. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not about patching. It's so much of the attack surface moves from the hypervisor. Correct. So the admins can't get to it mm -hmm. or even get to the keys, yep. which is a big benefit to me mm -hmm. from a virtualization security perspective. But now my attack surface is back at the VM mm -hmm. for encryption because once I'm in the VM, it's all unencrypted. Yeah. So now I have multi-layers of encryption that are now required, yeah. well, which is a really bad that, problem. <laughs> yeah, the upshot of that is it's not any different than the rest of the industry solutions. The right. downside of it is, can we do, can we do this better? You know, and so that's where we, we as a company, VMware, should be looking to, you know, can, can we help you with that sort of thing? Well, getting right. people to just do encryption, though, you know, there's this long tail. You know, you might it's be at the head end of things. There's this really long tail of people that are still, that are just learning about encryption, too. So, you know, we, that's a tension that we deal with daily. So I was actually thinking, will the virtual TPM capability give me better benefits there? Maybe. Maybe. So, I want to keep moving if, if you're okay with that. Sorry, Edward. Hey, you can do this with PowerCLI. PowerCLI add done. Here are, the, here are the additional cryptographic operations that you can do. So you can take an admin team and you can say, hey, you know, not to pick on all the junior admins out there or whatever, but you can say, hey, junior admins, you can encrypt things, but you can't decrypt them. Thanks for playing. You know, we've got parting gifts for you. That sort of thing. Uh, you can limit who can manage the KMS operations, things like that. KMS, you know, altering KMS settings is a uh, uh, is something that should be thought of, you know, uh, thought through there, so that uh, you're not endangering your your operations and stuff like that. We've got uh, some customers that are using vRealize automation to they don't give anybody the ability to de delete or decrypt VMs and they use a workflow tool something like vRealize automation or whatever to do that go through the workflow process to, to gain approval to delete or decrypt things that sort of thing again I mentioned earlier things that are not theoretical uh, loss uh, exfiltration of active directory domain controllers is a specific example I use when talking about this because it's a specific example I've been asked about four times now uh, real life examples. Hey, how do we go about preventing this? Hey, look, <laughs> you should patch. <laughs> Patching has got gotten a lot easier. You know. How uh, do you spell that? P A T C H. Adams. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you for whoever did that to me on Twitter. The uh, um, I I like it. And uh, um, <laughs> no, but patching. What are the two things? If you don't do anything else in an environment, what are the two things that you can do to prevent a lot of problems? Patching, good account and password hygiene. Done, you know? NIST 800-63, thank you, Roger. NIST 800-63 is a standard, 63B, I think, is the, the standard uh, about password stuff that's coming out now, or that has come out from NIST, that actually says that uh, us turning the screws on our users as far as passwords has actually gone in an unintended direction. All they do is write them down, storm places, that sort of stuff. Let them have them for longer. Make sure that they're good. Make sure that they're use something like, have I been pwned to like, you know, to actually check to see if they've been part of a compromise. With that, I thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. It's been a little weird to, been a little weird to be on this side of the camera. 
and uh, well, I guess we're all on this side of the camera uh, in this sort of operation. <laughs> but uh, talking with you, like I said, my history dates back to Tech Field Day 3 with a bunch of uh, our really surly clowns there. But uh, I really appreciate having all your time and your attention and things like that. As I said, if uh, things come up, we love feedback. Please give us feedback. If you run into something that you don't like, if you run into something that's got a rough edge, I love sanding down rough edges and products and things like that. Those are little things we can fix. And so let me know. Tweet them at me, uh, rplankers at vmware.com. Turns out my name is not Bob, it's actually Robert. Uh, and so thank you, VMware IT. So thank you very much. Have a good day.